Okay, well, thank you so much for coming tonight to this, our second talk in our third speaker series. I'm Carolyn Merrick. I'm the co-chair of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee here at the center, and we welcome you. Um, tonight's talk will be with Dr. Jelaine Schmidt on the origins of racial categories. A couple of housekeeping things before we introduce Peter Thompson, our center director. Um, everybody is muted and you will be for the presentation. There's just a ton of people, which is wonderful. And we wanna make sure that we hear Dr. Schmidt's presentation. If at any time you have questions or comments, please put them in the chat. And our moderators, Vince and Enid will ask um, or <clears throat> tell Jelaine those questions. This will be recorded and on our YouTube website, I put in the chat that address. And if you've registered for this talk and you have, if you're here, I will also send you that link when it's uploaded to our website. Uh, at the end, we have a survey and thank you in advance for filling that out. It really means a lot to us. If you have any more information you wanna share with us, any feedback, you can just email me, carolyn at the center .org. I'm the one that sent you the invite. So you just can click reply. I think that's it for me. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you our um, director, Peter Thompson. Thank you, Carolyn, uh, for leading us. I always appreciate hearing from you. Um, thank you to all of our diversity, equity, and inclusion committee that um, initiated this work. And I know Enid will talk more about that. Uh, thank you very much to uh, our speaker um, tonight, Dr. Schmidt, and all of our speakers who give their time freely. I see several of our speakers from the past, like Beverly Adams and last week's speaker, Susan Bro. One of the things that's neat is most of the speakers attend before and after their own talk um, to help make sure that they have some context of what all else is being speak spoken. And of course, it's also an honor the amount of time they give preparing and doing their own talk uh, and then giving the additional time throughout these series is really inspiring to me. Um, I think it is important to, to note and thank Dr. Schmidt and all our speakers. They are doing this pro bono. Um, these are busy people with great value that could uh, that have speaker fees elsewhere and they do this for the center and our community at no cost. So thank you to all of our speakers for that. The reason we're able to do that is because volunteers do do a large amount of the work planning this series and then our speakers are volunteer, uh, but there are costs to running the center. Um, we rely entirely on private philanthropy to make that happen. So to thank you to anybody who's on today who's part of our philanthropic family, that's the key to making the center success all these decades. Um, the center is a nonprofit organization. We're a 501c3. Our mission is to promote the um, opportunities for the key ingredients of healthy aging that research shows time and time again are the keys to helping seniors stay as independent as possible as long as possible. And lifelong learning is a key component of holistic wellness and has always been a key part of the center's programming for over 60 years now. We're really pleased to be able to provide this kind of information to people to let you absorb it, reflect on it, hear from others, and then act on it as you see fit. I'm really proud that the center is taking a leadership role in racial equity um, efforts. As Ian had said last week, we also have a racial equity task force that is about 99% done with its final report that'll go to our board this mm -hmm. month that will lead to a full um, equity action plan in the coming months. So you'll be hearing more about that as well. Um, and with that, I'm, it is my great honor now to turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Vincent Walker. Vince? Hey, how are you? How are you? Good evening. Um, my name is Vincent, um, Vincent Walker. Uh, I am the facilities manager here at the center. Um, I am also a co-chair of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Um, it is my privilege to welcome you to this evening's presentation. Um, hopefully with uh, the vaccines now being distributed uh, more and more, uh, more and more people and uh, with people practicing masking and safe distancing, um, at some point we will return to in-person programming and be able to personally welcome you into a safe space where healthy discussions around race and anti-racism can take place, um, as well as other activities promoting healthy aging. Um, our educational, social, economic, and communication systems in the US um, have for many years promoted stereotypes and distortions of black people and other people of color. Um, they exclude the contributions of blacks to the making of this country. Um, but after hundreds of years and in the light of ongoing violence against blacks, the true history of slavery and racism in the United States is finally unfolding. Here at the center, we believe um, that opening our eyes to the truth about systematic, uh, sy systematic uh, racism um, may erase some of those beliefs and attitudes about race and have been so deeply embedded in our community, in our culture. 
Here to guide us on that journey um, toward truth is Dr. Jelaine Schmidt, Associate Professor of Religious Studies at the University of Virginia. Uh, Dr. Schmidt's research and teaching uh, focuses on Latin American, Caribbean, and African dysphoria uh, religions. And, and she also teaches classes on critical whiteness studies and religion and on social movements. Um, she's an organizer with the Charlottesville chapter of Black Lives Matter. Um, she was a coordinator of the 2018 pilgrimage to the Equal uh, Justice Initiative in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, she has published several articles about Afro-Creole uh, religions and authored a book, Cajitas, Cachitas Streets, The Virgin of Charity, uh, Race and Revolution in Cuba. Uh, she has appeared on numerous national and international news outlets and frequently speaks to audience about white supremacy, policing, and affordable housing, and the list goes on. Um, Dr. Schmidt holds a master's, Master of Divinity, a Master of Arts, and a Doctor of Philosophy from Harvard University. Um, please welcome Dr. Jelaine Schmidt. Thank you, Vincent, for that introduction. And thank you, uh, uh, Carolyn Merrick, for um, uh, coordinating all of this. And thank you, Enid, uh, for um, inviting me. Enid is somebody that I know from uh, Sojourners uh, Church. And also, I think we were on the pilgrimage uh, together, you know, in, in 2018, yeah. uh, when we went mm -hmm. uh, with a delegation of 100 uh, Charlottesville residents, including Susan Bro, who I've seen here tonight as well. Um, to the Equal Justice Initiative uh, lynching memorial here in, in, in Montgomery. And we're gonna try and, I think we're gonna try and revive that, have another civil rights uh, uh, tour. And I'll definitely uh, keep Carolyn Merrick uh, informed in case there are folks out there that might wanna sign up uh, for this. I think I saw the, the Dukes here as well and you know who were also along on that trip. So anyway, hope we can do something like that again. But anyway, thank you for having me here um, and, um, I'm gonna talk here just a bit about um, kind of approaching race historically, you know, um, how, how was it that we have come to inherit the categories that we have today, um, which are often assumed to be kind of timeless and normal and, you know, kind of have always been and, and this sort of thing. What we're gonna see here is that um, actually that, that um, they've shifted a lot um, over time, you know, is, is, is what's actually happened, you know? Um, and so we'll look, we'll, we'll look at that. Um, I should say that, you know, people, you know, from time immemorial have noticed differences um, between themselves. They're kind of their in-group and then an out-group or, you know, those that were not, uh, you know, kind of included um, in their sense of who we are. You know, people have always noticed differences. Um, but this was usually, categorized under, under what, what we would call it, especially like anthropologists, social sciences would categorize under the, under the, uh, the classification of ethnicity. You know, that is, you know, uh, you know a group that, you know, um, has a sense of itself as having a common history and, and you know, cultural practices and this sort of thing. Um, and, you know, um, national uh, uh, allegiances, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but this, this notion that, uh, that, that skin color, you know, would be so determinative is actually fairly recent. And that's what we're gonna look at a little bit uh, uh, today. Um, and and we'll, we'll talk about, you know, the, the, the important thing to always keep in mind here is that uh, these categories were put in place by law. <laughs> you know, it's not just, a, you know, a, I don't know, you know, children on the playground, you know, spewing out, you know, bigoted statements or something like that. This is actually, you know, enforced by law. These, these categories were um, created by law and enforced by law and, and, you know, had the effect of law and, you know, and woe to those who might try to uh, uh, violate this, right? And this, this has its uh, real world um, effects, you know. So I want us to, you know, since we're living here in Virginia and Virginia has had a lot to do uh, with the history of racial classifications and racism, you know, um, a lot of uh, the practices that took root, you know, in Virginia um, influenced, uh, you know, the rest of the country. And um, of course, um, you know, I'm gonna, let's see, let me go here, share my screen here. Um, can you see that okay? Yes. Okay, great, wonderful, all right. Um, yeah, so we're, we're gonna, you know, I wanna kind of look at uh, the Virginia, kind of start with Virginia. And of course, I mean, if we're um, to 
have a uh, Anglophone that is kind of English speaking narrative of, of, of the, um, uh, the areas that came to be the United States, um, which we wouldn't need to do that. We could go to Florida and start with the Spanish narrative or we could go up to Acadia and start with a French one. There's you know, many different starting points we could have here. Uh, but you know, if we were to look at kind of English colonization, um, we could you know, um, think about the, uh, the Roanoke colony. It's often called the lost colony. And here I wanna ask if Carolyn, if you could put a poll up uh, for our guests. I wanna know if folks out there have heard of a historical figure named Virginia Dare. Oh, wow, look at this. This is amazing. Seeing a lot of folks. And Jelaine? Yeah. You, we can see all your slides if, if you want to put it in presentation mode. Okay. I, I kind of need it for my own notes, but. <laughs> no fine. worries. Then that's all fine. Right. All it's right. Totally yeah. Fine. Okay. So we're getting, you know, we've had quite a bit of people vote. And, and so what I'm seeing here is two thirds of the audience, it looks like, or of the folks that, yeah, that answered at least, um, you know. Uh, are, are saying, yes, you've heard of Virginia Dare, which, you know, I thought that was interesting. I had not, I'm 52. I did not grow up here in Virginia, of course. So this is a something that I understand people learn in their Virginia state history classes. Um, I also think it has, you know, something to do with, with age, that it was something that was considered maybe more important to the public school history curricula, you know, in, in the past than it probably is now. But of course, Virginia Dare was uh, said to be uh, uh, the first baby born to English parents uh, in, the, in, the, in the British uh, colony of, of, of Roanoke, you know, which of course, you know, at the time, you know, what we now think of is, is North Carolina and Virginia were all, you know, one colony. And this is, you know, now in what we would now call North Carolina. But anyways, she was born to English parents there. Um, of course, that settlement is, is also kind of referred to as the lost settlement, you know, um, it, it didn't do well. Uh, there's some evidence that you know th things got so so bad. There were you know, maybe, maybe attacks uh, by by neighboring uh, Indians, and and uh, uh, there was some cannibalism among the, the the British colonists themselves. You know that they had a very rough winter, and uh, by the time that someone you know kind of came back to resupply the colony, they were poof, just gone. You know, um, but you know, but there was you know some knowledge of this young girl, Virginia, who had done. Now this, what's important here is the. Uh, is the importance that is um, attached uh, to, to Virginia Dare is, is more um, what's key here in that, in that uh, it was you know, thought to be important to note you know, that, this, that this baby was born to English parents. You know, we don't know if there were you know, mixed, perhaps mixed race children or, you know, or, or you know, those that were, you know, there wasn't a concept of race then, but uh, those that were the descendants of, of um, um, there were Christians and there were heathens. Those were the categories. I mean, I, I think I've told you, you know, about how, you know, there have always been differences and people have noticed differences, but the categories that they have attached and what has been most sal salient, you know, what most important has shifted over time. And in this time, in the 16th century, 17th century, what was most important was, were you Christian or were you a heathen? And, and by heathen, what was meant was uh, someone who was not a baptized uh, Christian. So that was kind of the operative categories that the that these British colonists came with them, you know, uh, uh, you know, when they came to the to the New World. Um, and, uh, you know, so, the, you know, there was an attempt to, you know, to kind of, uh, uh, you know, ha have a colony there, things didn't go really well. And, and I should say, I, I want to talk a bit about the uses of Virginia Dare. There uh, is, uh, there's a very, uh, uh, um, very uh, old company here. I should go here to this. There's a uh, actually a company called Virginia Dare. You can see her the picture um, up here. Let's see if we can make this a little bigger. Sorry. Uh, you can see up here in this corner. Here is you know Virginia Dare. They have an image of her. Um, and look at this multiracial tableau of very very happy workers. You know I'm sure the uh, it's just, you know, and, and this is, it's, it's a company that creates uh, flavors, interesting, la vanilla, interesting, la <laughs> I can't make this stuff up. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, and, and they uh, are very self-consciously putting this tableau of multiracial folks here. Why? Because there are some other folks, quite prominent uh, white nationalists who have used 
uh, Virginia Dare as, as kind of their calling card for calling for a white ethno state, you know, and there's even a, uh, I'm, I'm not even going to direct you to the website, but it's, it, you know, I think it's be Dare, but I don't want to, you know, link to it, but, um, you know, there's some fairly uh, uh, prominent white nationalists, you know, that have that site, you know, so, so people are mobilizing, yeah, uh, this notion of having um, in, in this, you know, white ancestry, what the Brit what the colonists at that time would have just called English ancestry. Now here, this company, of course, really wants to put daylight between those sorts of white supremacist uses, you know, of Virginia Dare uh, versus what their, you know, contemporary company, you know, understands itself to be doing uh, today, you know. Um, you know, so here is, you know, the, the Jamestown colony, you know, um, and th this is, uh, you know, in, in our narratives about our history. Now, I didn't grow up in Virginia. Um, I should have asked a poll question about this, but you know, oftentimes the way U.S. history is narrated is that it's it, the, that the what we now call the United States started when the Pilgrims came over to the Massachusetts colony, uh, you know, in search of religious freedom. I mean, that's at least that's the narrative I was taught. You know, and that was in 1620. Now we could dial it back. If we're talking about a, a British, you know, narrative, uh, it's it's not. I mean, outside of Virginia, it's it's not always noted that actually prior to the Pilgrims' arrival in Massachusetts, there were British settlers in in what's now Virginia in Jamestown, you know, in 1607, you know, that were earlier. And why why the difference in what we you know narrative that we that we emphasize you know I, I think that the reason why usually the Pilgrims in Massachusetts narrative is favored is because it's more noble, you know it's like they came in search of religious freedom they were being you know chased around you know and, and being you know repressed you know by the Church of England you know in England so they came here to have a fresh start and have religious freedom that's a lot more noble narrative than the Jamestown colony even though it was, it was older, you know, uh, because the Jamestown colony was a, it was a, it, it was a commercial investment. It was completely about profit, making a profit uh, for the shareholders back home, back in, you know, back in, back in England, you know, um, and it, it didn't go very well either. It was not as bad as Roanoke had been, you know, um, you know, you know, 20 years before, but things weren't going real well also at Jamestown. There was, you know, also they've found recently kind of archeological evidence of, of, of cannibalism too among the, among the English settlers there, it just was so rough. Um, and what was going on was there were kind of, you know, these, these skirmishes between uh, the Christians or, the, or the, you know, the English and the heathens, all right? That is the original um, residents there, um, especially the, you know, the, of the Powhatan uh, Confederacy, uh, led by um, uh, Wahun Sunakak, you know, that he was the kind of the tribal chieftain of, a, of, an, of an entire confederacy that was there too. It was actually kind of a coalition or, you know, a, a kind of a collection of, of, of tribes that paid tribute, uh, you know, uh, to Powhatan, you know, the, the, a lot of folks there, you know. Um, and so there was, you know, there was some violent conflict between the settlers, the English settlers, the Christians, and their quote unquote heathen uh, neighbors you know, that were there. Um, and, and, uh, and, and, you know, th this notion that, you know, kind of never the twain shall meet, you know, um, and this was very worrisome for the investors, those that had started the, the Jamestown colony, um, because already 20 years before, remember that horrible, horrible situation there in Roanoke and that, you know, that colony, the colony, the lost colony just kind of disappeared. And here are these investors, they've invested in the Jamestown colony, and we're hearing about all these wars going on, these skirmishes between, you know, with the, with the, with the heathens, you know, what, what's going on. Um, and so, you know, some, some of the, um, you know, leaders of the James Hall, you know, were very alarmed about this. They, they want to keep the investments coming in, right? And they want to, you know, keep doing well. Um, and so it was, it was, you know, after some skirmishes, it was such a relief when there was this marriage between uh, Matuaka, uh, the, the daughter of, of Wahun Sunakak, of, of the Poet and Confederacy. She's, she's, most frequently know, uh, called Pocahontas. Her name was actually Matuaka. Um, her marriage to John Rolfe, you know, um, in, in 1614. So this was seen as a potential turning point, you know, and you, you kind of read the documents from there. And, and um, you know, the leaders are saying, you know, it, things started out kind of rough, you know, uh, you know, this stuff here, right? <laughs> but things are going swimmingly now. So definitely, definitely want to invest in this colony. 
things are going great. You know, all those skirmishes that you've heard about, that's a thing of the past. You know, now we're going to build, you know, there was actual um, imagining of a potential Anglo-Indian settlement that this, you know, that this can work. You know, there, there wasn't this kind of like, let's keep a bright line necessarily. It's like, you know, that this, this might be work. Now imagine what different sort of national narrative we might have, right? If that were our founding story, if the founding story of the United States, you know, rather, rather than, you know, these, these pilgrims coming to Massachusetts and, you know, and they're British and they're, you know, doing this and they're building their colony. What if our founding narrative were this? In 1614, Matawaka and John Rolfe got married and this is the beginning of an Anglo-Indian settlement. Yeah, wow, what a different narrative that would be for our country, wouldn't it, you know? Um, you know, and, and at this time, there's still not, uh, you know, enslaved people from Africa are not really part of this scene yet. All right, this is 1614. So this, you know, we're looking, so we're looking, we're kind of, this is kind of a nice window into what could have been, you know, kind of a hopeful moment. Of course, it's being portrayed in a very idealistic, you know, sort of way. It wasn't all wine and roses, but, you know, this could have been a different narrative, very different narrative, you know. Um, but then, you know, what happened was, you know, more skirmishes, more violence, more wars, you know, battles uh, between uh, as the English settlement grew and, and you know, and started encroaching on, on native settlements, you know. Um, and there was some um, question about, you know, could uh, heathens, you know, these Indians, could they become Christian? Because that, again, the Christian versus heathen, that was more the operative category rather than white. White didn't really exist yet, right? There's English, there, there's an ethnicity here, you know. Uh, versus these heathens, you know. So there was, you know, some questions, you know, in, in the 17th century then, you know, about, you know, um, you know, what 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 can happen with uh, baptismal status? You know, what, you know, can can someone be, uh, you know, th these, you know, f former heathens be said to be, you know, kind of legitimate, you know, Christians on par with the with the English that had come over? You know, these, these were the questions that were asked, you know. Um, and then, of course, enslaved Africans, you know, were brought to the colony. We've just marked, commemorated the 400th anniversary of that in 16, uh, in 2019 here, we, we commemorated the 400th anniversary of the arrival of enslaved Africans. Um, and, you know, in the definitions of slave, you know, they, this is at the same time, there are also indentured English people there, you know, who have a seven year contract on their work demands, right? It's like they got free passage to come over in exchange for working for, you know, a certain certain person uh, for seven years, you know. Uh, these Africans that are brought over, it's not, the, the, the law is not solid yet, you know, about, you know, whether this will be enslavement in perpetuity, all right. There's still, you know, things are not, uh, things are still very much in flux, all right, just like, you know, as, as with this, this, this marriage, like we're seeing, you know. Um, and so there, there's questions about, you know, uh, especially as some of the, um, Afro-Virginians, let's say, you know, folks that were born here then, um, uh, begin to become Christians, then there's kind of a question about, oh, well, what now? Because Christians aren't supposed to enslave other Christians. Per uh, the letters of St. Paul, in Christ there is no slave and free, right? Um, and so Christians are not supposed to be enslaving other Christians, you know? Um, and, and so, you know, so there was a lot of, you know, negotiation along the way, you know, uh, uh, what's going on, um, you know, and it was decided that, yeah, that, you know, Christian status, that meant, you know, you were free. Well, then there was fear that there would be a loophole and, 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 and uh, 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 kind of uh, the uh, ready uh, labor supply uh, might um, all become Christian. And, and, and then what, you know, these, you know, the, the British were, were worried about. So those, you know, continued adjusting through the 17th century, through the 1600s, around this question about, uh, about uh, what, what comes to be uh, race, what starts out as a religious designation and, and slowly kind of start over time, starts migrating over uh, you know, to, to uh, having Christianity identified with, with, uh, with whiteness you know, more and more. Um, and in, you know, part, part of what happens is that um, you know, with this uh, Christian status is that, uh, you know, laws get, get passed gradually that, that says there will be no whipping of the European indentured servants. Okay, those folks that have come with that kind of short-term work contract of five to seven years, you know, in, in exchange for their passage, they are not to be whipped. And they are, you know, of course, presumably Christian, right? 
but uh, uh, physical pun there is physical punishment of African slaves or, or of Afro-Virginians, you know, so we're, you know, kind of starting to see there's this breakdown, you know, there's this, you know, kind of defining, you know, ever more. And this is particularly so after um, what's called Bacon's Rebellion, okay? And, uh, you know, th this was an event in 1676, so, you know, a good, you know, 60 years after this marriage that we, we see here between uh, uh, Pocahontas and John Wolfe. Um, and there, what was happening was kind of out on the western frontier of Virginia. There were, um, uh, there were groups of indigenous folks there who did not like the encroachment, you know, um, that was coming their way. And so the, the colonial government in, in, in Jamestown was kind of trying, you know, brokering an agreement with them, you know, let's, let's keep the peace here. They've seen what happens, you know, when, when, when there's wars, people get killed. Um, but there were, there, what happens is there's a group of runaway slaves, Afro-Virginian slaves, and English indentured servants. They run away together to that Western frontier, what was then the frontier of Virginia, um, to get away from their respective masters, right? And, and in the process, they are kind of agitating. They're exactly what the Indians on the frontier feared. It's like, oh, here they come. They're going to take, you know, again, these, they're not distinguishing between enslaved folks running away and indentured folks. They're, all they see is people coming to take their land and resources. Again, it's not this racial breakdown. It's about who has access to resources, you know. Um, the colonial government in Jamestown is very nervous because the uh, the peace that they had brokered with these frontier Indians is now being threatened by these rogue, what they consider rogue elements, you know, of, 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 of um, rebel slaves and uh, uh, um, indentured servants who have absconded together, you know. Uh, and then they get a leader that is uh, Bacon, German, German, Bacon, who leads them, this, this ragtag group, this motley crew of, 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 of escaped slaves and, and uh, escaped um, indentured servants, and they march all the way to Jamestown and they burn down the House of Burgesses. I mean, can you believe, I mean, we've seen what happened, you know, January the 6th, how shocking that was to have the seat of government attacked. Well, in this case, this mob was successful, a multiracial mob, what we would call, you know, multiracial now, you know, burned down the House of Burgesses that just scared the bejesus out of the colonial elites. Who are slaveholders, right? And who had, you know, kind of brokered that peace with, you know, kind of frontier Indians. It's like, we cannot have this, they said. And so it's after this, particularly after Bacon's Rebellion, which again, what a different narrative we could have had in this country. What, what if our founding narrative was, yeah, indentured servants from England and enslaved Black Virginians got together and they overthrew the colonial government and they started their own, you know? What if we'd had a narrative like that from the beginning, right? That was just from the beginning struggling together. That would have been a different narrative too, right? And it didn't go that way. Because what happened was, and this is the important thing, is that laws are put in place that enforce definitions, all right? Uh, you know, and folks that are of African descent will be slaves in perpetuity, all right? And their children, um, will be slaves, all right? That is that the, that the children of, of someone deemed black will inherit uh, uh, the specific, you know, specifically their mother's status, which was different than English law. English law was you inherited your father's status. Well, now that's changed. Why? Because they wanna make sure they're keeping a, a servile workforce, yeah? So there's, you know, kind of a laying down of the law here in enforcement of definitions starts to come down, starts to get more and more solidified. And we'll see as we go along, you know, how much more this is so, you know. Um, so of course, you know, then we get, you know, as we get past, um, you know, the founding of, of the Republic. And, and of course, as we all know, the uh, infamous uh, three-fifths clause of the constitution, which, uh, um, uh, you know, relegated um, black uh, enslaved folks to only three-fifths of a human being and in terms of, you know, counting their uh, the population stats for representation in Congress, you know, we're aware of that. So this, this kind of dehumanizing, you know, again, being imposed by law and, and you know, defined by law, you know, uh, as a, a commercial um, commodity, you know, here and here we have here, you know, this, this picture here of, of uh, uh, you know, the slave ship here. 
uh, with, you know, kind of, you know, packing in, you know, humans, uh, commoditized humans, you know, who were to be, you know, the, the, the workforce there, you know. Um, so this, you know, you know what, what is, is starting to happen is that more and more um, blackness is starting to be identified with slave status. That was not always the case. You know, back in colonial Virginia, that we you know we know there were you know there were free blacks that had were, some of them were even landowners and stuff. Some of them even owned their own slaves. I mean, a couple you know not very many, but I mean again, it wasn't a color hierarchy. It was about class. All right, this starts getting more and more and more and more solidified. You know, into a black white binary. Okay, um, and part of what's going on is you know during this you know the slave trade. And, you know, here the kind of the height of it is the you know 18th century, 1700s. You know. Um, is what's going on is that there is, uh, this is also the rise of the scientific paradigm, you know, scientists who are um, studying, uh, you know, uh, genetic uh, um, alterations and, you know, and, and, and this sort of thing, you know, plants, uh, but also applying it very, uh, in very uh, ill-defined, um, um, inaccurate ways, you know, to uh, the supposed, you know, evolution of humans, you know. And so this, this, uh, the rise of the scientific paradigm is going on in the 18th century, the same time that this is going on, okay. And this is going, you know, so, so and it's also, this is another important uh, lesson to, to take away is that, yes, it's, it's enforced by law, um, and that uh, racial categories are about assigning value, you know, assigning value and divvying up resources is what that, that's that's why they're there. They, the, the, these categories don't just kind of float around, you know, or they're, and they're certainly not innocent. You know, it's not like a I don't know. You have a, a collection of uh, uh, I don't know dolls or, or or spoons. My grandma used to collect spoons. You know, spoons that you pick up at you know different uh, tourist outlets. You know, you know, oh, okay, the ones from Europe are here, and this is the, you know, it's like it's not just kind of it's not innocent, you know. There's, they're, they're, the reason to have these categories is to mobilize them toward an end and that has material effects, all right? Who's gonna be these people or non-people or three fifths of a person, however, you know, they're being defined, right? And who's going to be, you can, you can see here at, of course, at the, the top here is a, <clears throat> uh, is a uh, ancient Greek statue uh, in marble of, of the Apollo Belvedere, uh, Belvedere neighborhood out there where you are, is somewhere out there, but anyway. Um, you know, so this is, you know, here we have, you know, you know this, these perfect uh, uh, proportions, you know, that are, are presumed to be the perfect human being. And of course, you know, this ancient, kind of, you know, Greco-Roman uh, ideal is of course closest to present day Europeans, all right, who are of course the ones that are coming up with these schemes who are, owning these people, right? So there's there, this, you know, scientific paradigm and the rise of the slave trade reinforce one another, all right? These aren't just things that happen to be going on at the same time, they are reinforcing one another and co-creating one another. Um, the, the, you know, the, the, the practice of this enslavement precedes the categories. It's the categories that come later as, as, as the justification here, okay? Which is important to, to think about as well, you know? Um, so this, you know, um, this kind of solidifying definitions of, of what, and, and a lot of paranoia too, also about the slippages between these categories. They're trying to set them up so neatly, but what if they're not so neat, all right? Um, what happens then? You know, because this, if, if one individual is from, you know, a certain status and, and another from, you know, from a higher status and, and they're mixing, well, what happens? And this has political ramifications because recall, you know, since this is uh, this is something that's uh, um, put in, uh, you know, by force of law, these sort of are legal definitions by the government, you know, um, and yet these codes are being violated. These legal codes are being violated every day, you know, in in the in the slave uh, regime. Uh, you know, we, we know, uh, for instance, you know, Jefferson was not unique in this regard at all, you know, that many um, um, enslavers had children with the women they enslaved, you know, this was a very, a very common uh, uh, phenomenon, you know, and here I, I'm, I'm bringing this up here, um, because uh, this is a I, 1803, I believe it was, um, political cartoon, a caricature from a Richmond newspaper. 
And uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson, who's represented by the rooster here, uh, was running for office and his uh, political opponents were attempting to um, impugn him um, by implying here that uh, Jefferson was having a relationship with an enslaved woman uh, here represented by the hen. Here you can see her. Um, and, and uh, you know, in the cartoon that you can't really see the, the words here, but, you know, but they, it, it talks about how, oh, the, you know, this, the, you know, uh, you know, Thomas, you know, he's with Sally, where's, you know, Sally, I mean, so this, which is to say, this was in the newspaper, people, okay, you know, so this was not a secret, okay, happened a lot in slave society, it happened all over the Americas, and here as well, um, and, and, you know, uh, you know, great minds, so-called, you know, were not somehow immune from, from these sorts of uh, abuses of power, you know, in fact, you know, when you set up a system with that kind of impunity, it's, this is kind of almost guaranteed to happen, that there'll be you know, sexual abuse, you know. Um, yeah, so this was a well-known fact um, that this was going on. And, you know, we have lots of different accounts, you know, from visitors to Monticello that talk about how, you know, standing, you know, and Jefferson would be at table and the butler standing behind him was just a paler countenance, you know, of their host. You know, and of course it was one of, one of their sons, um, you know, that was there. Um, so, you know, so there's a lot, there's mixing going on all over the place, okay? Even as these categories are being laid down and even some of the very people who are laying down these categories are violating them. And here I'm gonna show, you can't really see here, you, you don't have to trust me on this. This is a letter from Thomas Jefferson um, uh, written in, uh, let's see, this 1818, I believe it is. And uh, let's see if I can make it a little bigger here. He's got these calculations that you can see here. This is just so crazy. Um, he has, four, you see these formulae that he has here? Now we know Jefferson was smart, right? He is, is figuring out, um, you know, what, what, how to categorize people whose parentage, you know, the, we have, you know, here it says, you know, half the blood of each will be, and then he has this whole formula, you know, uh, and he's figuring out who can be classified as white. You know? Uh, this is something that he's very worried about, it's, which is kind of curious since he himself is the father of, you know, uh, numerous mixed race uh, uh, children. Now, at this time, during Jefferson's lifetime, if an individual was uh, um, uh, one eighth or seven eighths white, okay, one eighth black, um, by the category of law, they were considered white. Right? And that's why when Sally Hemings was in, in Paris with Jefferson, you know, when he was in his diplomatic assignment, you know, very early after the Republic was founded, you know, that's why Sally Hemings cut a deal with him. It's like, oh, you want me to come back to the States with you? Well, here's how it's going to be. Sally Hemings herself was one, was one quarter black, three quarters white. She was the half sister of Jefferson's wife. I mean, this is so convoluted. You can't even, you know, can't even get around it. You know, she looked somewhat like Jefferson's late wife, just to say. So she makes a deal with Jefferson. It's like, oh, you want me to come back there? You know, people say, like, why didn't Sally Jefferson and her and her brother, why didn't they just stay there in Paris? They were home free. It's like, well, they got family back in Virginia, you know, family back. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons to come back. I mean, you're going to miss your family, you know. So Sally makes a deal with Thomas Jefferson. Go up there to Mount Cello. They, they, you know, will go into all this. She makes a deal. It's like, well, uh, you're going to have to free my kids. Our kids that we have here, you're going to have to free them. That's what's going to happen, you know. And, and here's, you know, here's Jefferson, you know, doing all these calculations. And as I said, you know, it's one, one eighth black, seven eighths white equals white, legally speaking, in Virginia at that time, too, because this switches. All right. Um, so something is is happening here, uh, which is that there have been slaves like all over the world, almost throughout human history, you know. Um, but the status of the enslaved was not determined by skin color. It was, you know, maybe, uh, let's see, you were in debt, if you had a debt, you know, and, uh, or uh, again, that whole, you know, uh, religion, you know, heathen versus Christian, or in, in, in any case, you know, um, Muslim versus infidel, you know, that, that would, you know, be enslaved. 
uh, you know, uh, yeah, debt or being, yeah, being a war captive, you know, all these things, you know, it was not usually a lifelong condition, you know, and certainly not inheritable, you know, so that's a very different than the new world modern system in the Americas of chattel slavery, okay, where it's an inherited con uh, condition. It's lifelong, all right, and it's tied to skin color. That is the most arbitrary thing ever, right? I mean, like, you can kind of understand it's like debt, okay? You owe some money, so come over here and work, you know, or, you know, an enemy captured, you know, captured in war, you know, th this sort of thing. Um, yeah, you know, religious, uh, you know, prejudice, that, that sort of thing. Um, but skin color, that's, that's, a, that's a new one. That's, that's uh, the, uh, I don't know if you want to call it contribution, but that, that's, that's what's new about slavery in the modern world, you know, you know 17th, 18th. 19th century in the Americas is that it's based upon skin color, all right? And, 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 and thus, you know, you know, yeah, a lot of things, you know, based on skin color, you know, like, you know, um, your citizenship status and, you know, and that, and that sort of thing. Um, and also I should say, you know, in, in the early Republic, I mean, in the, you know, the first uh, um, um, immigration law, you know, comes out you know, in 1790 that uh, it takes away the property requirements of being a citizen. Uh, white males could be citizens, you know, yeah, as of, you know, 1790, you know, um, uh, nationally, um, white men. And so it becomes very important then to figure out who's white, right? I mean, if this, you know, and, and, and thus, you know, here is, here is uh, Jefferson's paranoia and his, and his formulae that he's, he's lying out, well, who's white, you know? Um, and so, you know, what happens then um, after the Civil War, of course, is the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. The 13th Amendment, of course, outlaws slavery, all right, with that little loophole, unfortunately, for those who are incarcerated, right, uh, still be pressed into involuntary servitude, you know. 13th Amendment outlaws it. 14th Amendment, um, um, it, you know, grants equal protection under the law, right, You're supposed to be able to, supposed to be able to vote, you know. Um, you know, so these are the, you know, the, uh, the, Reconstruction amendments. And what's going on in Reconstruction? Well, we have our first real experience in a biracial democracy. That's what happens during Reconstruction. You know, I have, you know, from, from, you know, from the time of the end of the Civil War in 1865 until the end of Reconstruction in, in 1877, that's 12 years. There's this bright, not perfect, but this bright window where white folks and black folks, formerly enslaved folks and white allies held power together. You know, that's amazing. We had a higher proportion. We had in the, the state of Virginia at the time of the Civil War, about 38, 40% of the population was, was black. M most of those folks were enslaved, you know. Um, and we had a higher percentage after in Reconstruction, you know, after the Civil War, we had a higher percentage of blacks in public office. It still was never very high. It was only 24%. It's still never proportional to the population. We had a higher proportion of blacks in state government in during the Reconstruction period than we do now. And now it's kind of a higher water high water mark uh, as well. Um, you know, but here, you know, but this, this, this experience of sharing power, you know, was very um, anxiety producing uh, 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 for white folks who'd formerly been in power, you know, in, in, the, in the Southern states, you know. Um, there was, you know, a lot of fear of race mixing. Again, there's just this, this, this paranoia that, that, the, that the goal of, you know, of being together and sharing power is, is, to, is to have uh, racially mixed children. It's just, you know, the worst thing possible, is it? you know. So what happens? What happens is that um, Southern whites, former Confederates are very angry about this state of affairs, you know, whereby their former slaves are now writing state constitutions, you know, um, serving in public office and, and this sort of thing. Uh, and what happens is, you know, too often, whenever there's a compromise, it's black people's lives who get compromised. We've talked about the three fifths compromise. We talked, you know, we talk about the Missouri Compromise, 1820. It's like, well, we'll let in Missouri as a slave state if we let in Maine as a free state. I mean, it's always, you know, always this, you know, going on. Compromise, 1850, and now Compromise of 1877. When there's a contested election, there's a tie in the Electoral College. How are we going to do this? The Southern Democrats, the whites, say, we will give you 
Northern white Republicans, the presidency, yeah, that's Cleveland, I believe. Uh, if you remove federal troops from the South, if you will stop with this reconstruction oversight. And that was the deal that was struck, you know? And then all this ended, all this, you know, biracial sharing of, uh, of you know, it, you know, um, black people were, you know, the votes were, the right to vote was taken away. Uh, um, black people were, you know, kicked out of office, you know, former Confederates, you know, were coming back in, into, into office, you know. And there was what was called the Redeemer Movement by which was meant redeeming the white race. You see, this was the, you know, notion that, that uh, it was an insult, you know, for, for white people to have to live under, you know, shared, shared uh, power sharing, you know. Um, so what happens after Reconstruction, you know, after this kind of hopeful period, and I value, you, you know, there's a wonderful documentary, uh, PBS uh, called Reconstruction, wonderful documentary on this that came out a year ago, though, def definitely check it out. Um, so what happens after Reconstruction? This is when Jim Crow gets solidified, okay? This is when Jim Crow, by law, you know, the, 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 the definitions of race you know, that there's a, there's a hardening and a constricting of it. So you remember when we were talking about, oh, you know, Sally Hemings there in Paris cutting a deal with TJ and saying, you know, my kids are going to be one eighth black and you're going to free them. And right. And some of them did go on and pass for white. We know that, you know, for a fact, two of them did and two of them didn't, you know. Um, so one eighth black, seven eighths white in Virginia at that time, it's categorized as white, you know, um, Louisiana, much more fluid situation there. It's French, it's French Caribbean, you know, more kind of fluid definitions of race. They have an entire middle category called Creoles, Creoles of color, you know, who are neither white nor black, but kind of in between and have their own kind of ethnic practices and this sort of thing. Well, Homer Plessy was one such, was a Creole, all right? He was seven eighths white and one eighth black, just like Sally and TJ's kids, right? Right, who legally are supposed to be white, right? Well, things that kind of, changed. By the time you get to, you know, 20 years past or 19 years past the end of Reconstruction, get the Supreme Court case, you know, where Mr. Plessy, uh, and that's him there on, um, you can see, uh, was um, told he could not ride in the white section of the train, you know. Why? Um, because, because you're Black, that's why. But, that was news to him because again, he's from this Creole ethnic group. They don't consider themselves black or white really either. They were just kind of this, this other thing, you know? Um, but the law is hardening here. And it's like, you know, I don't know, you know, whatever you were doing down there in that formerly French, you know, Louisiana kind of loosey goosey or whatever. It's like, well, this is, you know, kind of the <laughs> Anglo-American law now is, is, is coming down and, and, uh, and defining this. And so, you know, so this is where we get this, this hardening, you know, during Jim Crow um, until we get to, you know, here we, you know, come to the, this is the uh, Racial Integrity Act of 1924 of Virginia, okay? And this was a law that was passed to even further solidify racial definitions. And now this is the, this is the, the codification, let's put it that way, that kind of the making official of the so-called one drop rule, all right, which, which said that uh, should in any, any individual ha who has any uh, uh, black blood, right, who, who you know, has, has any kind of discernible non-white uh, 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 admixture, it's called, you know, uh, is classified as colored, all right? And so, you know, there's, there's, there's no more this kind of indeterminate categories, none of the seven eighth, one eighth, or, you know, or this, or, it's like, no. And, yeah, and furthermore, who is enforcing this? Well, I'll tell you who's enforcing it. It's, it's the clerk down at the courthouse. You go down there and try and get a, you know, try and get a marriage license, you know, and it's the clerk that is, you know, so some 19 year old girl, yeah, who grew up in the community, you know, who knows everybody, you know, is, you know, is, is evaluating this, you know, and has a form to fill out and everything, you know. Uh, about you know who can get married, and it, it's this. This is the law, the uh, um, anti-miscegenation law, under which uh, um, uh, uh, Richard and Mildred Loving were tried. You know when when they uh, um, were were married. You know this couple from Caroline County, Virginia. There. Um, so this is you know to preserve racial integrity, and what of course the race that's being preserved, so-called, 
is, is the white race. I mean, that's, you know, and it says that, you know, numerous times in the law that, you know, this is the point is that, you know, we can't have, you know, Klecker, the, the, the registrar of vital statistics here for many, many years in Virginia said uh, there just cannot be this race mixture. And so there are only two categories and it's white and colored and anyone who, you know, one must be purely white, you know, I mean, there was a little exception that the Pocahontas exception of those uh, first families of Virginia, those kind of founding families, elite families who claimed, who would proudly claim that, oh yes, we are descendants of John Rolfe and, and Pocahontas, um, which seems doubtful because they very quickly went to England where she died. But anyway, this, you know, this is something they like to claim that that was the Pocahontas, you know, and unless it's, it's 1 16th or less Native American, then they're still considered white. But this, this kind of paranoia and, uh, you know, kind of laying down of ever strict, you know, and so you're noticing here the black white binary, okay, and this is key, okay, because again, since this is all about apportioning resources, all right, who's going to get what, materially speaking, we're talking about here, um, it's very important, and for Plecker and for this law, for Dr. Plecker at the Bureau of vital statistics in Virginia in this racial integrity law, there's only white and colored. And so there's no such thing as Indians. There's no such thing as Native Americans now. They are legislated out of existence because Plecker said, an Indian is nothing but a Negro with feathers, he said. He was paranoid and he would write to be people who would try to register themselves, you know, either you know, at marriage or, or, or the birth of their child and try to, try to register them as, as Native American. He would actually write back to them. We have this, you know, it's in the file, you know, it's like there is no such thing um, because in his mind, in, 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 the, in, in, in this law, um, Indians were merely, um, you know, they, they, they had uh, black blood. They were, you know, there was the pollution had gone on, you know, that maybe they were white people who, you know, were, you know, mixed with, with um, black, but there was, you know, they, they were trying to disguise themselves, trying to pass as white when really they were of African ancestry. So that was it, you know, this has consequences because, you know, that this is the reason, major reason why it's only been in the last several years that Virginia's native tribes have received federal recognition from the Bureau of Indian Affairs because they, their records were decimated. I've heard, you know, one um, uh, member of Monica Nation uh, from here in town has called it a paper genocide, you know, can't, can't prove your existence. You don't exist as a category, you know? Again, because the government, because the law, the state decides these things. These things are defined by law, all right? Um, and there, again, you know, in terms of, you know, who's, who's getting resources and, and, you know, in this sort of thing we have, you know, in the, uh, you know, post-World War II era, uh, you know, or, or even leading up to it, you know, um, who is getting GI benefits? You know, when folks come back from the war, I mean, there, there was, you know, a whole, there was a whole um, flood of immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe that had come in in the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, they were held to be, their whiteness, it was suspect. They were not considered white. They were Irish, they were Poles, they were Jews, Italians, you know, they were kind of put in this other category, you know. Um, what happens though, after World War II is that, um, uh, you know, when they're coming back from the war, uh, as the government is giving, you know, again, kind of doling out goodies, you know, especially those, those sweet, sweet mortgage deals, you know, through the Federal Housing Authority, they were only for white people. And so again, it becomes very important to figure out who's white, you know, and who gets kind of invited into the fold, you know, uh, are, um, you know, Eastern Europeans and Southern Europeans, yeah, folks that before were kind of suspect, you know, they're, they're, they were not, you know, kind of included in the category of white, by the end of the Second World War, you know, with this post-war expansion, and particularly with these new housing developments, real estate uh, is more and more determinative of, of, of race, right? Uh, and of course, you know, even black GIs, you know, who had served uh, honorably were not, were not uh, eligible, you know, for some of these benefits. So again, there are material benefits of whiteness, all right? The, the, these categories don't just sit there innocently they are mobilized toward an end, and 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 the end is deciding who gets the goodies, who gets what. That's that's what's. I mean, to say it just very baldly, you know, uh, you know, if I can. Um, so I, I don't want to 
talk for too much longer because I want us to have a you know a chance to you know to interact um, 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 here. But there you know there are some uh, um, kind of resources I can I can recommend after this. But I kind of wanted to you know kind of uh, open this up you know to a uh, conversation about um, how these racial categories came into being. So Carolyn, I will throw it over to you so that you can um, pitch some stories. Oh yeah, here we go. Hmm. Hey. Well, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So what I'm seeing here, still some yeah results coming. It's about half and half. You know, a little bit over half. Fifty-two percent of the folks that answered mm -hmm. anyway um, said that they they knew that the concept of race was a recent invention. But but you know, about half of folks said no. You know, this is this is kind of wow. Uh, this is kind of news, you know, or the, or the notion that this is new is, is news, you know. Um, so yeah, this is, you know, and that's part of the work that racial categories are doing is that they are tricking us into thinking that these are immutable categories of humanity that have kind of, you know, always been and always will be. And, you know, and, and, and you know, and that's why, you know, and if that were the case there, you know, why would the law be stepping in, right? I mean, already you're seeing all the nervousness, you know, Jefferson with all his calculations, you know, Dr. Plecker with his, you know, Racial Integrity Act of, of, of 1924. I mean, there's just a lot of paranoia about it, you know, and, and it just needs shoring up and shoring up, you know, by legal prescription and this sort of thing, but fairly recent, fairly recent thing. Um, yeah, so here's another question here to ask folks. And, uh, you know, did you know that the definition of race had varied by time and place? Much. Mm -hmm. It's about half again, almost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this, you know, a bit over half of the folks who, who answered anyway, about 57% said, yeah, that they were aware that the definition of race had varied by time and place, but 43% <laughs> said no, you know, so this is, yeah, so this is, uh, you know, and I mean, again, um, these categories, they're doing labor, you know, right. Omar Plessy down there, he thought he was Creole, but no, he's, you know, it's like, you're not allowed to be Creole or indigenous people here, Monacan nations that I'm Monacan and, you know, and the law says, no, Nope, you're not. You know, you know, um, uh, you know some, someone is, is, is deciding these things, you know. Um, yeah, so this, you know, this is, uh, and, you know, and, and here's the thing. Um, if this stuff, you know, th this stuff was constructed brick by brick. You can see it, you know, as, you, as you're walking through the history, it's like now there was that law and then there was this one and then this happened and then there was another law. And, you know, you can see it, the edifice being built, you know. Uh, and if it can be built, it can be unbuilt, <laughs> you know, exactly. uh, but that takes a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. So Jelaine, we've got some questions coming in. Okay, great. Um, wow. We really do have a long and complicated history, don't we? Yeah. So here's the qu first question. Can you describe how race is a social construct and not a biological construct? Well, that's 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 what I just did. I mean, it's it's. Uh, that's what you it's, just did. Yeah, yeah, I think that pretty much answered. Let me see. If race and racial discrimination were legislated into being, will we need to legislate it out? And if so, can we? Well, that, that's that's what the uh, attempt has been. You know, is 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 you know recognizing how uh, legally you know that this is that this has come about. You know. Um, and, and that's what uh, the civil rights acts were about, you know, in 64, 65 and 68, you know, was, was uh, uh, an attempt to intervene in that state of affairs, you know, I mean, again, because this had been set up by law, you know, and so, right. so this is a, um, yeah, but it takes, uh, it takes an extra bit of vigilance. I mean, as we're seeing uh, what's going on now uh, in Georgia, 
you know, where the state legislature there is moving very vigorously to uh, uh, curtail uh, uh, um, black voting rights. And of course it's, it's couched as, you know, kind of race neutral and stuff, but it's, you know, it's kind of, you know, being attentive to, you know, who's going to vote at certain times, you know, and, and, and this sort of thing, you know? Right, right. Um, so yeah, it, it, it takes a lot of vigilance. It takes building alliances, you know, uh, uh, to do that political alliances, you know, in order to, to uh, you know, kind of have this, this sort of uh, uh, movement, you know, in Congress and support for it. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Um, Sabrina Coleman wants to know, in your opinion, is this what's happening with Latinx people who present as white? Well, that's really complicated. And I, I do my work in, in, in Cuba, primarily is where I've been, and, and in Guatemala. And um, I mean, so first of all, this, this, this category of Hispanic uh, is a very recent one too. It came about in the, the Nixon administration. Right, there you go. Um, and, and, and that has, has been slippage with that too, you know, in parts of Texas and, you know, in parts of the, you know, 19th century and stuff, you know, the, the been considered white, you know, this sort of thing. Um, you know, so th this category, I mean, you know, what does an Argentine descended or, or Italian descended Argentine from Buenos Aires have to do with a uh, uh, Afro-Cuban person from Havana, yeah, have to do with a Mayan peasant from Guatemala? It's like that, that's, that's a lot of different kinds of people, you know what I mean? We, we get, and so kind of welding it together with this, with this uh, uh, label of Latino, I mean, you can see the constructed nature of this stuff, you know? I have a friend from a, a colleague uh, who uh, was uh, from a, you know, fairly a well-to-do family in, in, in Argentina, um, um, who, you know, self-identified as, as white there. He said it was very disorienting to come to the United States and be, and be considered Latino. You know, that was kind of not how he conceived of himself, you know? Um, yeah, so this is, uh, you know, these, these cat, there are, uh, and, and I, like I said, I study, study Cubans and uh, kind of that first wave of Cuban um, refugees who came to the States, you know, after the Cuban revolution uh, were uh, uh, white identifying, you know, and, and, and uh, perceived as white, you know, um, um, and, uh, you know, later waves were browner, you know, and black sort of thing. So this, you know, this is a catch-all category, you know, uh, uh, Latino, you know, that uh, uh, needs to be, you know, kind of parsed down. I mean, it's, it's much more complicated, you know. Right. Um, Susan is asking how many of these horrible laws are still actually on the books? Well, a lot of them. I mean, you know, a lot of them would be. I mean, yeah. I mean, and, you know, and there's sometimes a movement in, you know, in different states. I mean, so, so, I mean, some of them are no longer applicable. Like, for instance, I, I think it was like, yeah, it was like Mississippi or Alabama, like still had the anti-miscegenation, you know, against interracial marriage, you know, on the, even though it's, you know, not enforceable, of course, you know, but some of that stuff is still on the books, you know, and it, and when it would come up, you know, time and it's like, you know, just, just do a little house cleaning here to like get rid of this stuff, you know, and it's still, even, even though it's not enforceable, there are some people, no, you know, I just don't want to do that. Uh, we just had a little house cleaning here in, in Virginia in the last couple of sessions of the General Assembly of getting rid of some of that um, antiquated, shall we say, uh, formulations uh, uh, in some of our laws, basically just going through the law, but it's like, okay, get rid of this, get rid of that, my goodness, oh my gosh, you know, that, I mean, when, when, when uh, Frank and Linda and I, are, see Frank and Linda Dukes out there and some others and probably some others there, we were, you know, going to Richmond every, you know, this time last year actually to, you know, mm -hmm. to lobby for, uh, um, for a uh, change in the law to allow for uh, uh, local governments to remove um, Confederate um, monuments. The law that was that we were asking to change, which was 100 years old, still referred to the Civil War as the as the war between the states. You know, so if you can imagine, and there are a lot of laws like that on the books, you know, here in Virginia and other places that, you know, that um, they're not enforced anymore, you know, but they're still actually kind of still there in the code. And, you know, you kind of run across them every now and again, it's like, oh my goodness, what an old chestnut that needs to be kicked out, you know, but anyway, but, but more nefariously, uh, yeah, there are, uh, you know, supposedly uh, colorblind, you know, laws that are, that are being enforced that actually are quite targeted. And, you know, and this was like the case, for instance, with the gerrymandering in, in North Carolina, you know, where a federal judge said, you know, looked at the, at the, the lines that had been drawn around a congressional district and said that this was, uh, that, you know, that these were being drawn with, with pinpoint accuracy. That's a direct quote from the decision, you know, to, to exclude um, 
black voters, you know, this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's all sorts of uh, shenanigans uh, okay. going on uh, today, you know, and just yeah, right. Georgia, oh, just Iowa, just Iowa of all places, you know. Uh, last night got signed into law, something you know, very restrictive, you know, on yeah. voting. So yeah. Well, we've got lots of questions coming in. Okay, what was the relationship between African Americans and Jewish, if any? Well, we need to be specify what time yeah. period here. No time, time period being specified. specified. Do you have anything? Where's Ellie? Mm -hmm. Carolyn, can we unmute Ellie so that she can express a little bit more about this? I mean, I can say, I mean, yeah. you, you, huh? Take a minute. Here we go. Yeah. Let's okay. let her. Let's let her give more specifics. Okay, Ellie, you can unmute yourself. Thanks. Hi. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Schmidt, for presenting this really incredible program. Um, I was curious about the time frame, you know, from the sixteen nineteen period of time, mm -hmm. and if you saw any kind of relationship because of, you know, um, some of the similarities in the way that they were treated? There weren't similarities in the way they were treated here. I mean, in fact, I mean, like, if you go to places like Charleston, South Carolina, you know, they are, you know, very much a part of the elite, you know, other elite whites and they are slave owners and slave traders and, you know, and, and this sort of thing. They weren't treated the same, no. Um, there was one case of a, of, a, of a Jewish man who was lynched in Atlanta, you know, Leo, Leo Frank, it was in um, um, uh, 1915. And interestingly, this was like right around the time that the Klan, you know, was, was uh, uh, um, kind of reborn in, in, in 1950. Um, you know, and there were other incidents of, uh, you know, solidarity, you know, in the 60s, of course, you know, we think of uh, Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner, you know, the, the martyrs of Mississippi, you know, kind of killed in in uh, um, 1964, 65. Um, but now this, I mean, these are two very different groups, you know, uh, afforded different uh, uh, statuses and in different times, you know, this, this uh, parses out differently. Wonderful book by uh, Eric Goldstein um, um, called, let's see, if I can remember the name of it right now, about Jews and whiteness. And, and that's what really needs to be investigated here. I, I do a lot of, of teaching about uh, critical whiteness studies. And there's been a lot of studies on Jews and whiteness. And this is Eric Goldstein of a, a, a um, Jewish studies history professor there at um, Emory University. Um, I'm sorry, I can't, the name of the book escapes me at the moment. I'll, I'll think of it in a, in a minute, but it, it, it talks about, specifically talks about um, how Jews were categorized, you know, as they came to the United States, how that changed over time, how that varied by region, North versus South, how it varied by the first wave that came over in the earlier or mid, um, or well, let's, let's say, you know, kind of, um, you know, that, that came over from, say, Austria and what's now, you know, Austro-Hungarian Empire, you know, Vienna or Berlin and this sort of thing, you know, who were of higher class origins versus a later wave of Ashkenazi folk from Southern you know, Europe, you know, from the shtetl as it were, right? Very different class <laughs> origins of these, of these Jewish population. And they relate to black folks in very different ways, you know, very much differs by, by region and, and, and time, you know? Okay. Um, let's see, what else do I have here? Lori Balaban is writing to everyone and she says, I first learned about the construct of race from the very informative podcast, Seeing White. Oh yeah. Seen on radio. And if anyone is interested, she can give some more detail on that. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Oh, I thought of that, that the, the title of that book to which I referred, it's called The Price of Whiteness, Jews, Race and American Identity. And it's by Eric Goldstein. Um, excellent, um, excellent history. And I, I assign that to my students in my classes. Awesome. And it talks, it, it really parses out the relationship between um, Jews and how they are categorized racially and the, the relationship of that to African-Americans. Can you contrast perspectives on race in Europe by comparison to those in the United States? I know that African-Americans have reported it feels completely different in France than in the US. Mm -hmm. However, there is plenty of racism in France, mm -hmm. of course. Right, right. Well, there's not this legacy of lynching 
there. Yeah, you know I mean, this, this racialized violence and just the, the terror, you know, that, that with how this has been enforced here in the States, you know, it's, it's not, you know, they, they do terrible things where they're pogroms versus Jews. That has a long history in Europe, you know, uh, you know, attacks on gypsies, on Roma people. I mean, there's, there's other categories of folks, right? They're catching hell there, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, there's not, I mean, part of what's going on is, see these European powers like, you know, the, the Dutch, the French, uh, you know, even the Germans are so much to some extent, you know, the British, they, uh, you know, were, had way more slaves than were in the United States. The, the United States had about 6%, 6 percent of the slave trade ends up in the United States. About 600,000 captive Africans were brought to what's now United States. The rest, the other 94%, the other nine-ish million, yeah, we're all over the Americas in Brazil, you know, to the Portuguese colony, you know, uh, you know, in the British colonies and, you know, on the islands, you know, in, in you know, in Jamaica and such, you know, uh, in Haiti, you know, um, French colony, uh, Dutch Guyana and other, you know, so, so these European countries uh, all were enslavers, all right. Um, the difference is that these slaves were out in the colonies. They did not live in the metropole, all right. Very different than a slave society like the United States, you know, which you know starts out as a colony and then becomes a slaveholding and a, you know, especially in the South, we can talk about it being a slave society. I mean, it's actually the gear around which everything turns here, you know. Um, and again, so and, and it's that and it's that hatred. You know, enslaves them on that. It's like there's a lot of force that that uh, uh, is, is brought to bear legally to enforce that status, you know. Um, and so that it, it's that living in close proximity, uh, you know, here in the states, and the, and we've talked about all of these these laws. We've seen them how they get stacked up, stacked up, stacked up over time, you know. So so the the kind of the the violence, you know, the, the and the threat of violence is much more intense here in the states. Is there there's racism everywhere? This is what I found, you know. It, it just varies in how it's expressed, you know. Exactly. I, I used to think when I first started going to Cuba, I had this very idealized notion. It's like, oh, everyone's just this, you know, mixed brown, you know, country and, and uh, <laughs> they've got their racism problem solved. And of course the revolutionary government would want everyone to believe that too. Uh, it's not the case. Um, and, you know, and what I found over time was like, oh, it's just, just manifests in a different way. <laughs> the racism here does, you know. Right. Uh, in, in Cuba. Yeah, and in terms of, I mean, like Paris, you know, is, is famous. I mean, you have, you know, Josephine Baker and, and, and James Baldwin and, you know, so many black artists, Romare Bearden and others, you know, who have spent time in Paris, you know, especially early uh, 20th century uh, is going on almost concurrently with, with the Harlem Renaissance in New York, you know, there's back and forth, you know, um, and, uh, you know, a lot of artistic foment among, you know, kind of African-American expatriates, you know, in Paris. And yeah, there, there's, you know, many, many commentaries on that, you know, Baldwin and others, you know, write about, it. it's like, oh, I can breathe. You know, it's like, the, you know, the, this sense that, you know, I'm being respected mm -hmm. for my intellectual and artistic contributions. I'm not worried about a lynch mob around the corner. And, you know, so, so yeah, there, you know, is that still racism there? Um, takes different yeah. forms, you know? Right. So we've got several comments that I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm trying to pick up the questions rather than the comments, because you can all read the comments. Um, okay, so let's see. Christine Walker is thanking you for your informative presentation. And she wants to know, can you speak to the mindset of colonists that made them think it was okay to capture the Africans and bring them to Virginia as slaves in the first place? Well, I mean, the... I mean, some of the 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 kind of the, the backdrop for this is uh, we can look at some of the um, 15th century and uh, early 16th century um, explorers, in particular, I'm thinking of, of, of the Portuguese going around uh, Africa and um, getting the imprimatur of the Pope, you know, for a, and um, uh, to enslave those. Um, uh, who were uh, heathens, and there's that word again, you know, the, the, the heathens, you know, uh, 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 in this case, you know, were they Muslim or were they following a, a local African religion? Uh, this, the Pope said, uh, made them uh, uh, worthy of, of enslavement by Christians, all right? Um, and, and um, you know, and, and then, uh, you know, the doctrine of discovery, another, you know, kind of papal goal a bit later, um, 
looking at, uh, you know, when, when the Spanish um, are, you know, kind of uh, going around the new world and claiming it for themselves. Um, and then the Portuguese are, you know, kind of quick on their heels and trying to carve off Brazil and, you know, and all this, you know, and, and the Pope kind of, you know, laying down, you know, what are the, what are the laws, you know, with respect to, to settlement and to, you know, and to, you know, who can be enslaved and this sort of thing. So it's, um, what I'm saying is, uh, it's no accident that this, that this, the, that the slave trade is coinciding with the colonization of the new world, right? And the exploitation of the land there, you know, kind of grabbing it from natives. And again, remember what I said about Jamestown, this was a commercial venture, right? This was commercial mm -hmm. colony. It was about making money. They're like, you know, they're trying to turn a profit. It's like, we won't be like Roanoke. Don't worry. We got our act together this time. Stay with us investors. Look, we're doing great, you know, you know. Um, so that it's no accident. Uh, you know, it, it, the, the the slave trade is 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 shooting up because um, the, this so-called new world is being exploited for profit, you know. And so, yeah. And so th this is, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, to, to profit, you know, ma ma making slaves, you know, enslaving someone, the Pope and others said is okay if they're not Christian. You know, this, and this is, you know, this is fueling the, the, the slave trade. Now we know, of course, you know, I mean, some places like the Congo, they've been um, Christian, the, king, the kingdom of the Congo had been Christian for a hundred years, you know, before the slave trade really hit there, you know, in earnest. So this is not, of course, uh, always followed, but it's, it's a justification. Again, these, these definitions or it's, it's material goodies are being divvied up yeah. and skin color is a real convenient way of, of doing so. What macro steps do you think need to take place in order to reach racial parity or, equi or equity in the United States? And how long do you think it'll take? Well, we haven't got there yet. I mean, I mean, we need to pass a voting rights uh, law. You know, the, the, the John Lewis uh, bill has been sitting there for forever. And it's, you know, if ever there was a time, you know, we can see the need for it, what's happening in Georgia, what's happening in so many places, you know, with voter disenfranchisement. So that, I mean, that's just so basic, you know, protecting the franchise, you know, this is supposedly the, the basis of our citizenship, you know, is, is, mm -hmm. is, is voting, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and so that, that, that is key, you know, is, is, is um, the, because everything else flows from there, you know, so protect right. protecting the, the, the franchise and, uh, uh, you know, if Joe Manchin won't give up this pipe dream of, you know, of, of maintaining, uh, you know, uh, the, the, you know, the, the filibuster, you know, cloture vote, uh, you know, we can kiss that goodbye. We're never going to get that law through, you know, we're really on a precipice here. There are some things that need to happen now, like now, like in the next two years or before some Democratic senator dies and then the balance of power shift, you know, there's some things that need to happen now, like the Voting Rights Act. You know, or we're really, you know, we're going to lose it. You know, we're, we're really on a precipice here with respect to, you know, in, in some places, you know, they got it gerrymandered so bad, places like Wisconsin, where you have basically minority rule. It's been baked in to all the state and you know, districts and the you know, congressional districts, you know. Um, so there's some real basic things that need to happen with respect to voting. It's so fundamental. You know, that's why the work of Stacey Abrams, who is going to be on Rachel Maddow tonight at nine o'clock. Uh, her work, you know, there in Georgia is, is, is so important, you know, and that's why the Georgia legislature and the governor, that's why they're clamping down on that so much, trying to get Black people not to vote, you know. Mm. So Beverly Adams is asking, you showed us in a slide that racial slavery was the result of skin color, but doesn't that make things even more complicated? We know that many Blacks have passed as white, and that mm -hmm. still goes on today. I'm, I'm not sure I understand the, the question. Beverly, you want to unmute yourself and clarify? There you go, Beverly, you can unmute. Okay, sorry, hi, Jaylene. Hi there. Good, good, good. I was just saying that um, when you said it was about skin color, that's, you know, pretty simplistic, but in fact, it's so much more complicated than that with Blacks passing for whites, um, even to this day. So mm -hmm. it's not just so simple as skin color. So what do you think? You know, and you bring, so I should clarify what I mean. Race is, it's the perception of race. 
That's what I should say. The perception of race. Yeah. Homer Plessy yeah. has black blood. You know, in the community. And, well, and, you know, so somebody, you know, somebody decided this, you know, so these, you know, I mean, it, you know, and, and, and TJ and Sally's kids, you know, very light complexioned. So, so defined as, like you know, as black, you know, in, in various, you know, so yeah. So, the, and, and this is the paranoia around, uh, you, you know, or I mean, so, I mean, so skin color is often, you know, kind of a marker, you know, of, of so-called race, you know, um, but race is really about perceptions and, and the imputation of a definition on, on someone, you know, trying, trying to uh, uh, assign, assign a category and thus a value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking also that um, uh, uh, with Megan and Harry about this, this notion of skin color, which just really kind of blew us, I think, all away. If that question, in fact, was asked, what color do we think the baby might be? Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. Will it be black behind the ears? No. <laughs> <laughs> or his nail beds. <laughs> okay, question from Liz Hacking. Do you see generational breakdown of racial categories? Absolutely. I mean, so many more kids these days identify as mixed race, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then, you know, and you go to California, and again, the categories themselves are shifting too, all right? And then how people identify, you know, within that. So there's that. You go to California, uh, it's uh, um, uh, no uh, race uh, I, has a majority. I mean, I think there's a maybe a plurality of whites, you know, or I'm um, not quite sure where things are at now, but I think a majority of the, of the babies that are born there, kids under five in California uh, are not white, you know, or either mixed or you know, some mm -hmm. non-white uh, uh, race or something like that. So yeah, I think there are shifts. Also, I think that with uh, what, it, what has happened is that uh, Latinos have eclipsed African-Americans, again, with the complication that some Latinos are Afro-Latino, you know, and I studied them. I wrote an entire book about them, in fact. Um, but, uh, you know, in, kind of in terms of, of kind of the categories as, 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 as uh, we have them in the U.S., um, you know, about 13% Black and about, you know, I don't know, 14 or 15% or maybe even more by now, maybe 17% Latino. Um, and, you know, again, because uh, folks coming from Latin America have a different conception of race and different ways of marking race, that has um, made the conversation here in the States even more fluid in the last couple of decades. I've seen this you know, over the period of my lifetime, you know, become, uh, you know, kind of more, more complicated, you know. So yeah, it's, it's changing uh, with immigration, you know, and a kind of a demographic composition, uh, um, you know, you know of, of the nation, you know, and, and, uh, and, and also, I mean, what, what, what was, uh, I think it was the 2000 census, I believe, was the first time that folks could mark mixed race, you know, Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 I, and I should mention that, I mean, I've been saying throughout this whole talk that, you know, that this is by per force of law, I mean, these are, the government is creating these categories and enforcing them and measuring them and, you know, you know this, this is what's going on. And one of the key ways you can see the racial categories changing is to look at the census every 10 years. Every 10 years, it's different categories, you know, uh, are, are coming in and are taken out or renamed. And it's just amazing to see you know, uh, the, the census forms themselves are, are an account, are primary documents, if you will, about the shift in racial categories, you know? So yeah, I believe it was, you know, 2000 was the first year that folks could designate being of mixed race or more than one, you know, and that's really shifted things, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay, Maggie Flynn says, I have seen news articles about a 2017 archeological excavation at Hatteras, North Carolina, mm -hmm. indicate that at least some of the lost colony of Roanoke assimilated into the native tribes. Do you mm -hmm. have any thoughts as to how this relates to conceptions of race and hierarchy in the early colonies? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I've heard that the people have said that um, visitors would come back like in the next, you know, like late 16th century, 1590s or whatever, or early 17th century, you know, 16 tens or whatever. And they said, this is reports, you know, uh, that they would kind of run across these light skinned Indians, you know, that had kind of greenish eyes, you know, and, and this sort of thing, you know, that were assumed to be perhaps, you know, the mm -hmm. descendants of, 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 of this so-called lost colony. Um, and, and also, oh, and, and also um, some indigenous, you know, like 
indigenous folk identifying there uh, in that area uh, who used certain English words, but they were these very antiquated English words, you know, kind of like if I start saying thou and thus, and you know, you kind of know, it's like, oh, this is Shakespearean or something, this is not, <laughs> you know, but, but kind of these antiquated words that kind of pointed to like, where'd they get that word? Nobody talks like that anymore. I mean, you know, they kind of, these like vestigial things. So I don't know much about that, you know, uh, other than that there, you know, been these, 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 uh, uh, you know, archaeological digs that are finding, you know, all, all sorts of stuff. And, you know, and what that says about, you know, relationships between these groups. I, don't know. I mean, there's a lot of antagonism. We have a lot of evidence for that, you know, attacks and you know, skirmishes, wars, you know, etc. cetera. Uh, but also, you know, kind of complicated things going on, you know, different, you know, temporary sometimes alliances or, you know, you know, these are, are shifting probably according to time, you know? Right. So um, everyone, we have lots and lots more questions and I know that we will not get to all of them. But what we do promise you is that we will send these questions to Dr. Schmidt and we will have her answer them if she's willing to do so. And then we will send them all out to you all. So you'll get all the questions and all the answers. Will that be okay? Please nod your head so I'll know it's okay. All right. I'm I can also, if I can share something here, um, I've got a, there's a people that can explain these things better than me, you know, that- uh, Okay. Have you know have worked really hard you know to to and to you know kind of uh, look at some of these very questions you know that that you're that you're asking here and of course you know Tony Easy Coates you know um, and 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 uh, you know there are other uh, um, books you know here by Robin D'Angelo uh, Ibram Kendi you know who's been a guest here um, in, in Charlottesville a number of times so anyway I will send this you know to the center and they can you know kind of and we will share mm -hmm. send these books out yeah right, right. So we also we also have quite a few people on today who are giving us reference materials and Thank we'll be you. sharing those also and I need to say while you're doing that Jelaine you are awesome thank you so much thanks for having me this was wonderful it was a wonderful presentation Thank you. I think everyone has benefited by it.